Hello and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Rosie Murphy. And I'm Sammy Roth, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We're in season six. We've reached episode 16, the penultimate episode of Lost. It is what they died for. There is so much to discuss in advance of the finale here. We are going to get right to it. Let's do The Hatch. We are so excited to be back here in the hatch, on the hatch. We've had this debate before. With all of you, thank you for your patience. We know it's been a few weeks. There's a reason for that. Sammy was able to arrange a conversation with Jack Bender, who, if you remember, was our very first guest on the hatch way back in season one. That's right. Jack uh, was with the show almost from the very beginning. He was the lead director and basically ran the thing from Hawaii as an executive producer. And I I was trying real hard to schedule with him, but he was in Halifax filming the second season of uh, the TV show From, which stars Harold Perrineau, a.k.a. Michael from Lost. And he uh, he sat down with me as soon as he got back. It just, uh, you know, they had to finish the show first. We'll have that for you this week uh, and next week to talk about The End, which he directed. But until then... As you know, we start every episode of The Hatch the same way, and that is with hot takes. We are going to start out with some takes that we got from you all after our episode about Across the Sea, starting with this one from Pip. Hey, Rosie and Sammy. This is Pip from Yorkshire in England. I really love the discussions about Jacob and his brother, their relative merits and fates. For me, they add a satisfying deeper layer to the show, following the survivors and then the Dharma folk. In my first watch, I was so relieved to get the oldest backstories of Richard and then the origin story of the mother and sons. It was finally the explanation I've been waiting for to feel satisfied with the show. I've been mulling over an idea that came to me during your Abiturno episode, and this is my hot take. That couldn't lost the title itself be not only a description of the survivors of Oceanic Flight 815, but also a description of the outcome of the centuries-old game between the brothers, that one or both of them lost the game they've been playing. Jacob lost his life as a a consequence, but the man in black lost the long con he'd been playing with the island's inhabitants. So we could interpret lost as not just the more obvious and literal adjective for Jack and co, in the sense of being lost, but it's also about the losers of a terrible and deadly game that's come to an end after centuries of play. What do you think? I, I gotta tell you, I love this idea. I'd never thought about the meaning of loss that way, that it's also like the outcome of the game. I'm, I'm into it. And I love that they both lost. Yeah. That's fascinating to me because in a, in a game that is presented in a relationship that is presented as such a binary, right? Light and dark, good and evil. They both lost. (laughs) You know, there was not a winner and a loser, which is what we would expect. And frankly, they both deserve to lose. So I'm I'm fine with that. Yeah. But well, you've heard our complaints about Jacob and the man in black as humans. We'll we'll do some more of those this week and certainly next. Um, We also got a couple of interesting um, hot takes shared as as YouTube comments that related to Across the Sea um, that I think are worth bringing up. Uh, One of them from uh, Brendan, which, which frankly, I'll just basically summarize here rather than read the whole thing. Basically, he's making the point that um, he says, I've always thought that mother was a version of the smoke monster too. She says a fate worse than death is what happens if you go into the light at the heart Mm -hmm. of the island. And and Brendan points out that she said that as if she seemed to know firsthand what would happen if you went in there. He goes on to say that 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 would help explain how she was able to recall that destruction at the camp of, you know, the other, Mm -hmm. the other people on the island who had attracted her son, the man in black. Um, I think that's a a very excellent point, that the mother was very possibly a a smoky herself. Um, I think it explains a lot about her. And we got a sort of similar comment from Lost Explained on YouTube talking about how what we see in Across the Sea uh, is the mother essentially splitting her role between the twin boys. Jacob becomes the protector, the light, and the man in black becomes the smoke monster, the dark both different takes on the philosophies of the mother. I, I think that lines up with, with Brendan's comment that in addition to being the protector, she also sort of contained that, uh, you know, monster energy within her, whether she was literally a monster or more, or more figuratively. Yeah. I'm looking at the, the comment from Lost Explained now, and they write, the brothers became two halves of the same whole. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Like the idea that the mother contained kind of both. And that's what made her such a singular and powerful protector, I guess, of the island. Um, Like she was able to do great harm and, and wreak great destruction. 
and also to, you know, in theory, serve this good, right? By keeping, keeping the light burning and... I wonder if now that that role has been split in two, that it's inevitable. There will always be separate entities representing the light and the dark, or if it's possible for that to come back together at some point. That actually brings us really nicely into this hot take from Shaw Booker. Hi, Sammy and Rosie. This is Shaw Booker. I've been an ardent listener to uh, the Hatch podcast in season one, but this is my first time calling in to season six, so it's like I'm the lighthouse. I've been here the whole time just showing up until season six. But uh, Sammy and Rosie, I wanted to talk about something you guys touched on in the sundown episode. And uh, my hot take is this, is that Jacob is not a good person. He's incredibly flawed himself. Um, He feels inadequate because he knows mother loved the man in black more. He's the consolation prize. That's why he doesn't really care about the people who adore him. He doesn't care about Ben or Richard or any of the others throughout the centuries. Because the real love that he wants, he can never have. And that's the love for mother. And all he can do is try to prove mother and brother wrong. That's all he has to hold on to. And to pick a new protector of the island. That's just my two cents. Yeah, I mean, do not think Jacob is a good person. Definitely not an unqualified bearer of the light. Um, And I wonder if, you know, if we take this idea of the yin and the yang splitting... Is it, is there something to be said for Jacob really can't do his job because his brother is separate from him? Like, there's no way, if, if the way that the mother was able to fulfill her duties was by containing great power and great evil or whatever, um, if Jacob only contains half of that, is he unable is that why he, part of why he keeps failing? <laughs> I mean, I guess That's he's being actively undermined by his brother and the other half. Right, but, but, but as, he, as he says to our survivors this episode, that was his fault. I mean, mm-hmm. he, he gives them the whole speech about how, you know, the reason why I, you guys are sort of stuck in this position now is because I made this mistake. I fucked up and created this, you know, monster that I couldn't control. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I kind of think maybe you're right. Maybe I'm wrong about there needing to be both forces separate. Maybe now that the man in black has been vanquished, uh, maybe he really can just represent the good and that'll be it. I don't know. Yeah. This is a, a great topic. If anyone wants to call in for the final episode uh, <laughs> after this and leave us their own take on this subject or any other, the number for that, as always, is 9546-DHARMA. 9546-DHARMA. We typically ask to leave it to 60 seconds or less, but nobody ever does that, and it's the finale. So as long as you can get it in in two minutes, you know, we'll, we can still use it. I would love to play a dozen hot takes in the finale episode, so please call. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Um, I have a hot take. Yeah. Tell me. For this week's episode. I'm um, just changing the subject from Jacob and the man in black entirely, because we'll, we'll have plenty of time for them. Um you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll do my usual thing and just be a little salty in an otherwise, you know, wonderful episode. It seemed like they were still, even at the very last minute here, like playing up, you know, like this whole Kate Sawyer question in this episode, like in small ways, mm. but you know, stuff like in the flash sideways, Sawyer and Kate doing a little bit of, you know, low key flirtation mm-hmm. where she's begging him to let her go. And he says, I can't because I'm a cop. And she's like, you don't, you know, you don't seem like a cop. And then, um, you know, moments where uh they're staring, they're standing out at the beach, staring at the water forlornly, and Kate kind of puts her head on, on Sawyer's shoulder and starts crying. It's like, at this point, we get it. It's Jack and Kate. Like, I've, I've accepted that. I'm fine with that. I'm happy that Sawyer moved on. Like, we, I just don't need this anymore. Like, you don't need to play the string out on this one. I'm good. That's, that's a fair critique. I do think... um I didn't actually read any romantic undertones in the On Island stuff at all. My feeling was that Kate and Sawyer have just been through so much together that there's going to be an intimacy there, even if it's not romantic. And we've seen that throughout season six, right? I mean, remember the episode where Sawyer goes back to the Dharma cabins and Kate follows and they sit on the docks and they talk about how he blames himself for Juliet's death. And that's a good point. That's a good point. You know, like so much has transpired between those two that I think at this point, their relationship is just a lot more and a lot deeper than that. 
Maybe it's a misread by me. I'm just thinking about what went down at the end of season five, and yeah. I, I, I guess I think the show's has having a little trouble letting it go. You're, you're probably right. That's a safer. That, that's maybe a better way to read it. But I, I still sense something there. I, I don't think you're wrong. I just prefer to <laughs> think that we can all exist on a higher plane that isn't purely about about that. But um, if I may, we got another hot take from our listener Ashley that touches on some similar themes. Hi, this is Ashley, and I have a hot take about Sawyer. At the beginning of the show, I really disliked Sawyer's character. He was just so cruel to everyone, and I assumed that he was just going to be this annoying antagonist through the whole show. Um, of course, we pretty quickly figure out that this tough guy mask stems from a very traumatic childhood and a lifelong inner narrative that essentially says that people only get close to you in order to use you. A lot of fans love the Sawyer and Kate relationship, but I, I never did because even though Kate and Sawyer had physical chemistry, I think she still really contributed to this inner narrative that love means using each other. They literally have that one conversation in season four where Sawyer is like, look, if you want to use me for something, just say so. That being said, if the light at the center of the island can be interpreted as hope in the midst of darkness and evil, then I think the light at the center of Sawyer's island, at the center of his incredibly dark and broken history, is Juliet. Juliet is able to cut through Sawyer's walls and his brokenness, not by force or by swooning, steamy chemistry, but just with sincerity and simplicity and just by showing him that caring for someone day to day um, can mean something other than using them to get what you want. That's why I love their relationship so much, and that's why they were in the church together in the finale. Thanks for an awesome podcast. I really enjoyed um, following along. I mean, one thing that I really like about this take from Ashley, the idea that Kate was not, you know, going to be right for Sawyer or was not going to represent what Sawyer needed going forward because she, you know, she she represented to him this form of love that he thought was the only one that existed of people using each other. And that's, you know, that he was sick of that, that he, you know, uh, just was was over that. I, I, I like that idea. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I agree with it or not. I want to put some more thought into it, but it's interesting to me. Yeah, I, I like what Ashley said about his relationship with Juliet being kind of that, that light that Sawyer found on the island. And we'll get into this. I'm sure I have some issues with Jacob telling the remaining candidates that they didn't really have anything to live for back on earth and they all needed this place. Um, and, and about him saying they had a choice and then, Oh, but if you don't take it, you're all fucked. Right. But one of you has to take it. Yeah. That's not a choice. Um, we'll come back to that. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I think, like, there is something to be said for, like, Kate was the person Sawyer met when he was still his pre-island self. And Juliet was the person that he met when he had kind of evolved a little bit and was ready and open to, I don't know, that higher self or evolving further or however you want to phrase it. Um, Juliet was able to meet a more mature, more thoughtful, more evolved Sawyer. Um, and it was sort of that version of Sawyer that I think was in that relationship rather than pre-island con man uses people Sawyer. Yeah, I don't know. So I think, I think both are like real relationships. It's just a matter of the man Sawyer was at both times and it's reflected in those. I like that a lot. And and what that makes me think is, gee, it's a good thing he didn't meet Juliet earlier because he wouldn't have been ready for it. He would have been a huge dick to her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting that she she both was it probably was in some ways a cause of his transformation, but not, uh, you know, cause and effect. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't think she would have spent a single moment in a relationship with him if he were still such an asshole. Right. Yeah. What uh, what is your hot take? We've been uh, you've been holding out on me. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I want to talk a lot this week about Ben, but there's one line in the flash sideways that I think surprisingly tells us a lot about Ben. And it made me laugh. And then it made me think, which is when Desmond drives his car to the school and Ben recognizes him as the man who hit John Locke with his car. Ben starts shouting. It's him. The guy who hit Mr. Locke. Somebody call the police right now. I saw what you did. I'm making a citizen's arrest. Don't. And it's (laughs) funny. Like it's clearly a laugh line, but I laughed. It just made me think like, Oh, what an interesting version of Ben who has no real power and yet wants to do something. It's this such an interesting inverse of the Ben we're used to who typically has a lot of power and wants to 
be very deliberate with how he uses it and be very thoughtful about which baskets he is putting his eggs into. This other Ben is able to say, oh, that's the guy. He did a bad thing to this man that I know. I'm making a citizen's arrest, which is, of course, like nothing. But it's this thing that <laughs> that people say that, um, you know, has an air of of righteousness and heroism. And I just thought it was so interesting in contrast to the Ben that we see on island. I like that a lot. And actually one, let me try to add to it if I can. I think that on the island, Ben craves the power that is bestowed on him by others. Like he needs, you know, he needs the blessing of, of Jacob or the imprimatur of Jacob's blessing. He needs to be in charge of the others. He needs to, to be seen that he, you know, that it's him, not Richard, who mm-hmm. really is in charge. He, in the flash sideways here, when he says I'm making a citizen's arrest, it's almost as if he's saying, you know, I, I have all of the power I need vested within me right here. I don't need anyone to sign off or to tell others, you know, hey, this is your authority. Like, I'm just going to do the right thing and do what I think needs to be done right now based on myself. Exactly. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, he doesn't need a title. He doesn't need a formal role. He has enough agency to do what he thinks needs to needs to be done. Although I agree with you, one interesting thing on that note, I did enjoy the moment when he was in the nurse's office and she called him Mr. Linus and he, he corrects her kind of Dr. Linus. Mm-hmm. He does still have a little bit of pride there and the one, uh, you know, the one bit of um, prominence or of, um, you know, prestige that he, he does have. Yeah. He can't quite, he can't quite let it go. So. Wait, wait, wait. But, but before we actually go on, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, can we, but I want to talk more about Ben, but I had a thought about the Desmond Ben scene too, oh, about Desmond. Yeah. I'm sorry. Let, let just quick, quick pause on Ben. What I, I had a similar reaction where I was enjoying the scene just because it's a fun scene, and then I had a like a wait a Desmond rabbit hole. I went down. I was thinking, you know, Desmond gets out, of, and Desmond's so calm and cool and collected this whole time, and he just does whatever, and it's it's magical to watch. But when he gets out of the car and starts beating up Ben, it does feel to me for a moment like wait, 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 like. I kind of think Desmond is actually enjoying this. Mm. Um, he just, he shows, he, he just gets a bit more animated and shows a bit more, you know, emotion than he does at any other point this episode. And it, I was just, I was thinking that there's potentially some part of him here still as he, as Ben relives the pain of getting knocked into, you know, and Desmond punching him in the face and remembers that moment in real life. I kind of wonder if Desmond is also here channeling some of the, emotion he felt in that moment in real life that he's returning Ben to where he was so full of, you know, rage and terror about what was going on with Penny and what, because Ben had just, you know, Mm -hmm. threatened to shoot Penny in front of his child at that point. So I, I kind of think this might be the one time when we see a little bit of, you know, Desmond actually coming out and being like, yeah, you know, like I'm doing this because I've got to do this, but I also don't mind punching this guy in the face a bunch of times. Yeah, I think you might be onto something there. Maybe, maybe more satisfaction than enjoyment. I just some, and I, I could be, you know, I could be putting my own feelings onto the scene, but mm-hmm. I somehow sensed a little bit of satisfaction in Ian Cusick there in the way he played that. Yeah. And maybe I'm also thinking about the story that we've now heard a bunch of times about how the first time he punched Ben, he actually did give him a black eye and Emerson, you know, acted through the scene. But right. <laughs> I, I think there's something there. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong. So back to Ben. You were going to take us to the island, I believe. In classic Ben form, I have lost count of the number of times this has happened this season. He makes an agreement and then he double crosses someone. First, he, Richard, and Miles, which is a super fun little lineup. I have the same note here. The dialogue for that scene when they're all joking around together is fucking hilarious. Oh, it's great. Um, but they get back to the Dharma camp. Miles, you know, gets weird and evasive and it's because he knows where Alex is buried. Then he walks into his house in relatively short order, finds Charles Widmore there and basically agrees to help him. And then, of course, minutes later, shoots him. Um, yeah. A couple things. One, I think it's interesting when Widmore says, you know, as usual, I'm three steps ahead of you, Benjamin. Like, that's typical bluster that you could hear from either of them. But I, I kind of think Widmore is... Not, not that he's, I think he's right in that moment. I think Ben then very quickly outflanks him. Mm-hmm. But at, but at that point in the episode, you know, Widmore, Ben is threatening to shoot Zoe and Widmore's like, he's not going to shoot you. Just get out of here. And, and Widmore is right about that. 
Ben is there to get all these explosives, and we've been having jokes about, oh, we need lots of explosives, and then you learn Widmore has already wired the plane and is ahead of Ben, which he's right about. And then uh, Ben, you know, says, when Widmore says, oh, I got visited by Jacob and he sent me here, and Ben's still feeling the pain of, of the, you know, the Jacob thing says, you're lying. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, you know, we don't see it, but I think it's pretty clear that Widmore's telling the truth about that because yeah. none of his actions and none of the stuff he knows would make sense if Jacob hadn't visited him, or at least... But but what I but what I do find amazing here to get to your question about what's Ben up to I I guess at this point I don't know if Ben knows what he's up to but I think mm-hmm. he figures it out pretty fast and and the moment where I think that becomes clear and I almost missed this was when he asks Widmore for the walkie talkies oh before sending Widmore you know before sending Widmore and Zoe to hide behind the bookshelf while he you know faces his fate so he claims with the man in black. In the finale, next episode, he will be using... Miles ends up taking one of the walkie-talkies, right? He gives one of them to Miles. And in the next episode, while Ben is supposedly using those to... um, Supposedly is helping the man in black, he's secretly communicating with Miles about what Locke is up to and where they are. Right. So I, I, And and then ultimately, the walkie-talkies, by the way, are what allow them to inform Kate and Sawyer, hey, come to the plane on Hydra Island, we're getting out of here, and that saves them. Mm But I, so I think the, I think when he asks for the walkies in that moment with the man in black coming, I think he knows he's going to use those walkies to betray the man in black. I think at that moment, he's basically figured out what his end game is here. I think he knows that he wants to use the man in black and his trust to get Widmore dead because he Mm -hmm. wants Widmore gone, but he also doesn't want the man in black to win either. Mm -hmm. I think he sees, I think he figures out in that moment, okay, the man in black is my, is my means to killing Widmore here. But I need an out so that, um, you know, to fuck up whatever the man in black is doing so that I'm not a part of that or so that he can be defeated. That That's my read of this walkie talkie moment. Oh, I, that's that's really smart. Um, ben is really smart. I definitely agree that when the man in black offers him control of the island and he accepts that that's hollow, right? It reminded me a lot of um, the episode Recon, where we see Sawyer and the Man in Black sort of strike a very similar bargain, where the Man in Black says, I can get you the thing that you want, and it's too little, too late, and we as the viewer know it. Um, right. But Sawyer is such a good con artist that he goes along and is able to convince the guy. Yeah. I think that's kind of what Ben is doing here, right? Like, mm. this... At- this point surely is too little, too late. Like, surely Ben is not still holding uh, out for control of this island? I think deep down the man in black even somehow knows it's, I mean, he, he essentially, he says to Ben at the end of this episode, I'm going to destroy the island. Mm-hmm. And then that comes up between them next week, I think, and he right. has some line about, well, it's like, I guess I didn't mention that it would be at the bottom of the ocean, but you can still, ha- you know, so you should just come with me. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kind of think the man in black at this point is just blinded by how long he's been at this and how badly he wants to leave. I, I, I think that Ben, like Sawyer earlier, really out, well, I guess Sawyer not so much because of the submarine, but I think Ben ultimately does outplay him here mm-hmm. and gets what he wants at the man in black's expense. Yeah, I agree, which is, I don't know, it's just so interesting to see the man in black out, outwitted again. Both of their acting, Emerson and Terry O'Quinn, is absolutely phenomenal in this episode that... The, the scene when they're sitting outside on, you know, on the porch mm-hmm. after the smoke comes and gets Richard and it's like. I need you to kill some people for me, Ben. Um, why would I do that? Because once I leave this island, you can have it all to yourself. That he's just holding the knife there, kind of polishing it with his fingers like, oh, man, that's just a, you know, it makes your skin crawl. Should we talk about how sweet it is as long as we're on Ben and the flash sideways to see him and uh, Alex and uh, Mira Furlan back as Danielle Rousseau, like acting like a little family? It really is sweet. Yeah. Um, And when, you know, it's it's a a little heavy handed when Rousseau says the thing about, you know, her father died when she was only two and you're the closest (laughs) thing to a father that she has. And like, okay, Uh, but it's it lands. It's very, very sweet. It, it felt to me kind of like, not that she created this place any more than the rest of them, but it almost felt to me like a fantasy for Alex that mm-hmm. she would, you know, have of like, you know, her mom and her, you know, dad figure who in real life, you know, were just basically trying to murder each other the whole time. Like, you know, now both doting on her together and potentially, you know, finding a connection with each other. Like, that just feels like Alex fanfic right there. Mm. 
Oh God, how sad. Yeah, but it's nice because you can she, you know you kind of get to see it. She gets to feel it at least for a minute. Yeah. I don't know. I liked it. Anyway, what uh, what else is on your mind? Which character should we talk about? I think before we leave Locke, we should talk about Jack and Locke, and specifically about oh, yeah. the scene where Locke decides that he's going to have the surgery and goes to tell Jack. Um, it's real quick. We got another hot take that I'm going to loop in here. Hey, Sammy and Rosie. This is uh, Robin Maine, and uh, I just want to leave my hot take for um, why they died. Uh, first off, I can't believe that we've been on this journey together since 2017 through covid through all this nonsense, and it's been just fantastic. Um, and my other hot take is I just really love the flash sideways and the scene with um, John Locke and Jack just really, it just showcases how amazing Terry O'Quinn is as an actor. Just the, his facial expressions, I don't know, just really good. Anyways, thanks again for doing this podcast, and uh, that's about it. I mean, yeah, I, I agree with this a thousand percent. Um, there are so many like super close up shots on John's face in this scene and his like, I don't think it was just my TV. I think it's shot this way. It's like kind of overexposed almost. So there's like a lot of light pouring in and his eyes are just really bright and his like mouth is kind of quavering. There's just like so much going on. It's yeah, remarkable. the quavering I noticed. He, he was having trouble, like, getting the words out almost. It yeah. felt like, like, I can't believe I'm saying this stuff. The, the moment I love the most when he says, I'm sorry, are, are you saying that I sent this man to run you down? No, 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 no. But, but what if all this... Maybe this is happening for a reason. It's so close to when to what he says in White Rabbit. Yeah. And when he starts to say... What if everything that happened here happened for a reason? And he starts, but what if all this, and he cuts himself, he can't quite, you know, commit to it. He says, maybe this is happening for a reason. It's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And then Jack, you know, sort of leans back and thinks about it and says, Mr. Locke, I want to fix you, but I think you're mistaking coincidence for fate. You can call it whatever you want, but here I am. And I, I think I'm ready to get out of this chair. It's a it's a wonderful scene. It's a it's a high it's a highlight of an episode that has a lot of wonderful scenes and mm-hmm. wonderful dialogue. Like for an episode that basically exists as set up for the finale, like this in and of itself is just a spectacular forty five minutes of television. Yeah, and I know I've I've complained in the past about this whole Jack wants to give John this surgery plotline. Um but this scene really turned it around for me. I mean, the way that, that John's character is approaching this and recognizing it as potentially, like, maybe there's some fate or something at work here, um, I just think is is really beautiful to watch. I agree. And talking about, you know, just continued mea culpas on Jack, which I feel like we've both done a lot of this year. And, and by the way, stick around for the Jack Bender interview, everybody, because he has some really interesting, you know, background on what was going on behind the scenes with him and Matthew Fox filming this season. Um, I, I felt like in this episode, which, you know, when Jack is finally really, you know, he's stepping up, he's becoming the man of faith, he's agreeing to be the leader. I was actually getting from Jack some of the leadership qualities that I felt like, you know, I wanted from him all along. Yeah. And maybe you'll have something to point out, but the two that jumped out at me were one, when they're all standing on the beach, you know, mourning the loss of Jin and and son and Saeed at the beginning, you know, as much as Jack is there mourning that with everyone else, like he, he's also keeping it smart. He says, look, we need to go find Desmond because he's in a well. And if, if Locke wanted him dead, we're going to need him. And that's exactly what Saeed told him mm-hmm. in those real tense few seconds before the bomb went off. And despite everything else going on and the deaths and the chaos Jack heard it, he internalized it, and he knows in this moment, despite the fact that they're all mourning, they need to go do that. It's, it's smart. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, he's not, he's not being hot headed. Kate's the one who's hot headed here, frankly, which I understand, you know, making the, we need to kill Locke speech, and he agrees with her, but Jack is thinking through practically, you know, what do we need to get done to do that rather than just charging into the jungle, like I think he might have at some point in the past. As recently as the end of season five, right? He was single minded in his <laughs> pursuits. Um, 
Agreed. And I and I also like just to flag one more thing after when he he finally goes with Jacob to the river to drink the glass mm-hmm. of you know magical water or whatever. He, he he actually has that last minute, you know, he he feels a little bit of reservation. He says to Jacob, how long am I going to have to do this job? Yeah. And I think that reflects, you know, a, a vulnerability and, a, you know, a just a hesitance that's a valuable quality in a leader. He's not doing this blind. He's not doing this without thinking about it. He's not just, again, charging ahead because he feels like this is the right thing to do. Like he's really put the requisite thought into this. And I think the fact that he, he feels that last bit of doubt that he's trying to quell actually tells us in a way that he's ready for it, in a way that he wasn't before. Yeah, I mean, I I mentioned the end of season five kind of glibly there, but I really think this is a a useful contrast, right? Because so much of season five, we talked about Jack becoming a a sort of man of faith and putting his faith in, in the idea that all of this is happening for a reason and the island is important and there are greater forces at work here. But still pursuing those ends with blinders on, right? To, mm. um, single minded in his pursuits. And here he's not single minded. I mean, he, he sits around the fire with the other survivors and they all think about it and he stands up and, and really does seem to have a feeling of, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. Like this is finally the answer which is what he thought he had at the end of season five. He thought he had, this is finally the answer. I can make it so that we never came here. And that wasn't the answer, but, but I think you're right. I mean, being confronted with Jacob and these real stakes presented by someone who knows, right? This isn't Jack making a bunch of inferences. This is somebody saying, I get, I guess in season five, it wasn't Daniel Faraday was there. It wasn't just Jack making a bunch of inferences, but I think it's, there's, it's different. Yeah, it's different. there's something to be said for a, a quality of a leader being that you know when to follow and when to, when you're getting advice that you need to take and instruction that you need to take. And I think, yeah, like Jacob is, Jack knows that he needs to listen. Yeah, it's kind of bringing together the listening and following in yeah. a way. Like he's... He's taking a leadership path, but it's a path that's been laid out in front of him by someone who, you know, is, is sort of trying to encourage him to follow it and has laid out the pros and the cons and given him the ch- sort of a choice, which we'll get to. But yeah, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's not him in a vacuum, just like reacting to something and charging ahead, which I feel like was his approach before. Yeah. I mean, I think he spent this whole season thinking about it, going back to the lighthouse episode, the Daniel Faraday thing. There was like one episode and it was all <laughs> taking place over the course of like three or four hours, as right. I recall. Um, this is very different. You're right. Can we go back to the beginning of the, the scenes with Jacob and the survivors here just to, to sort of parse through it? Cause I feel like there's oh, yeah. a whole, a whole bunch of stuff to pull out. Oh yeah. The, the first, the first thing on my list here was just seeing Kate's reaction to Jacob mm. and just like seeing her just just like at the beginning of the episode when she was you know expressing her fury with with Locke for what he had done like Kate immediately goes after Jacob with so you're the ones who wrote our name on the wall you wrote Jin and Saeed and son's names is that why they're dead and Jacob says I'm very sorry and Kate rightfully says you're sorry no I want to know why and 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 you know I just I love to see it because somebody needs to be saying this stuff to Jacob and I'm so glad that Kate is not holding back. She's not taking bullshit. No, and and Jacob's answer to that question is underwhelming, right? I mean, he says, mm-hmm. you know, the question that's asked that I think is the right question is Tell me something, Jacob. Why do I got to be punished for your mistake? What made you think you could mess with my life? I was doing just fine to you drag my ass to this damn rock. No, you weren't. None of you were. I didn't pluck any of you out of a happy existence. You were all flawed. And I I think there might be something to be said for you needed this place. But like there are, as we see, I mean, I think one of the things that the Flash Sideways does so well is present other paths, right? Like who would these people have been if they had never gone to the island and if there were sort of a butterfly effect taking place, right? And their lives had gone just a little bit differently. Right. If if they had never gone to the island and if Jacob was never manipulating them. Yeah. Well. And, and again, maybe a couple of other circumstances were different. Um, which 
circumstances can be different all the time. Life is random. Um, and I know he's, he, he is doing a bit of a mea couple culpa thing where he says, you know, I made a mistake. I should never have, have let my brother become this evil creature, but you don't get to just <laughs> sacrifice person after person in your pursuit of atonement for your mistake guy. Right. And I, I get that he's saying, oh, if I don't do these things, everyone's going to die anyway. Right. I think that the other half of the coin of what you're describing is, and we, we alluded to this earlier, the whole thing where he says to them, I want to give you what I didn't have, a choice. Mm-hmm. Well, a choice with a gun to your head after, you know, is not really a choice. And I think when he made this decision for these people that they needed the island more than, you know, the island needed them and that he was going to manipulate their lives to bring them here, like, that was him making the choice for them. Like, he... He took their lives out of their control and reshaped them to, you know, their lives to his end. So he says, oh, you have the choice now to, uh, you know, to say no and to not do this if you want. But one, he manipulated them to get to this point. And two, he's also telling them everyone's going to die if you don't do it. So I don't know. I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for any of that. <laughs> well, and also, you know, he, he says to Kate, I, I crossed your name out because you became a mother. But you could still take this job if you want. Oh yeah, sorry. I I already made that decision for you. But like, I guess you mm. can mm. go against me if you want to. And and yeah, there are four of you, and one of you has to take this job because the end is very close, is what he says, right? And um, it's down to the four of you. That's also not a choice because they can't all say no, right? What happens if they all say no? Did Jacob really have to destroy dozens of? people's lives to... Right. Pro- probably hundreds or thousands over the centuries right. that he's been doing this. Right. Yeah. I will say that, as annoyed as I continue to be with Jacob, that one thing about the scenes with him here, it does make me appreciate a bit more in retrospect across the sea, mm. which I know we, we complained about extensively. Um, but you definitely couldn't do these scenes, which are good scenes, by the way. Like, we're complaining about Jacob and his motivations, but I mean, I think it's very compelling television. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't think we could have gotten to that point without something like Across the Sea. I mean, some of our ideas, I think, for how they could have condensed it or shifted around the storytelling might have been good. But but I, I, it does make me realize, like, yeah, you, you did need to do that backstory or the resolution here with Jacob would not be, you know, remotely satisfying as a story. Yeah. I um, We haven't talked as much about The Flash Sideways this week, but I I loved some of the scenes in The Flash Sideways. Like, just the opening sequence of this episode, starting with, you know, with Jack's eye opening, calling back the pilot and sort of foreshadowing the ending of next mm-hmm. week and, um, you know, going to the cut on his neck, which has been a building mystery that's going to pay off and then seeing him banter with his son and the happy son and Claire's there. And then I, I had actually forgotten the phone call that he gets about the coffin that that oh, was going to yeah. be Desmond putting on a voice. And that was like a, I mean, that just that whole bang, 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 bang there. There were, there were a bunch of sequences like that in the sideways that I really, really enjoyed. The Anna Lucia showing up. Desmond, you know, lording his knowledge over Kate and Saeed in the back of the police van and getting them agree to that, you know, ridiculous deal. Like, there was some, it was just really fun. Yeah. Something that came to mind as you were talking is, on the island, Desmond is presented as the fail-safe. The one person who has the ability to pass between places without being harmed, to to kind of defy the laws that govern this. I think what Woodmore says is that he's uniquely resistant to electromagnetism. Right. Yeah, for sure. That that represents all those things. Um, and the word failsafe is used at some point. Um, in the flash sideways, Desmond is the first, well, I guess he's the second to wake up, but then he becomes the person who is putting all of this into motion in a way that almost suggests that he is not moving between those worlds because you you can't, but it does seem like it's a little bit more fluid for him, right? He's been able to unlock enough that he knows who these people are. He knows what he needs to do. He needs to bring them all together and wake them all up. He's sort of the one guy in both realities who can come to the rescue or no one else is capable of doing it. Yeah, in this like kind of metaphysical way. You know, he's not a hero in the traditional sense, but he is the only person who is able to, like, access the necessary 
knowledge or exercise the necessary power because it's so weird and specific and special. Um, and I almost think about, you know, the constant and everything that was happening in season four. He was the person who was able to move between, he was able to control movement between time in a way that nobody else was. You know, it, what this reminds me of a bit is some of the conversations we've had with Henry and Cusick where he's talked about how he, you know, to him, Desmond was just the simplest character. Yeah. That he, he just played him as, you know, straightforward. He wants to lead a happy life. He wants to have Penny in his life. He wants to have a, you know, a, a family that he loves and that loves him. Like he, despite all of the crazy metaphysical stuff, he's just talked so much about how he grounded that character and having simple values and simple desires and a simple outlook on life. Mm. And I kind of wonder if that's at play here, both in, you know, the reality of life with Desmond as a fail safe, who's, you know, immune to electromagnetism and Desmond in the afterlife who, you know, can sort of accept and understand what this place is easily in a way that others can't. It, it almost just seems like his, he's got his head screwed on so straight and has such a straightforward relationship with, you know, with his life and with what he wants in life that that none of this stuff, none of this stuff bothers him or can stop him or gets to him in a way that it would others. Like electromagnetism, whatever. I mean, the afterlife, whatever. You know, there's people trying to kill everyone, whatever. I know what I'm doing here. Like, you know, he. I, I wonder if there's there's something to that, something to the just his his sort of easier interface with the universe than others. Yeah, it's this is a, a clumsy metaphor a little bit, but it's almost like. All of that stuff is able to move through him easier. He's not blocking it. He's not fighting it. It's just like he doesn't experience the shock of it in the way that other people do mm. because he's not exerting force against it, right? It's just sort of like right. letting it – yeah, I don't know. You might be onto something. He doesn't – you know, I think with the electromagnetism and with Jacob and the man in black and with the afterlife, like – I think under, unlike a lot of other people, he doesn't care why this stuff is happening. Hmm. Like he's not concerned with the larger metaphysical or world ending implications of it. Like he, you know, he, he isn't worried about the science. Like he wants to be with Penny. He wants to keep his friends safe. Like he's just so, I think, you know, focused on that and not giving a shit about anything else that it just, yeah, it, it kind of bounces off of him. Yeah. in a way that, that is maybe more true for him than for anyone else. You know, one character we haven't talked about, uh, we haven't talked about Jin and Sun mm -hmm. that much, and that's because they're dead, sadly. But um, one one moment following up on their deaths that stood out to me, when when Kate was, you know, uh, when Jack was stitching up Kate's mm -hmm. bullet wound um, at the beginning of the episode, she talks about Ji Yeon. She tells Jack, she says, they had a little girl, you know, her name was Ji Yeon. Jin hadn't even met her yet. It was interesting to me to hear her talking about Ji Yeon in the past tense. Her name was Ji Yeon, as if you know, as as if she she no longer exists. As if um, you know, she's she's a figure of the past now. I guess, I guess I just I, I read it that way, or I you know, it, it jumped out at me the past tense because we had talked about Jin's decision to sacrifice himself and just sort of, I think, having a level of discomfort of you know him sort of leaving their daughter to be on her own out in the world, never having met her, and to make the choice that dying with son and not living without son was more important to her than being a... was more important to him in some ways, seemingly, than being a father to the daughter he'd never met. So I just, like... I don't know, I wonder if the show was trying to, you know, uh, uh, justify Jin's decision or that the writers were trying to, but it was just interesting to me to hear even Kate here to think about Ji Yeon as if, like, Ji Yeon was a person who existed in a thing that happened but not sort of an active concern anymore, which is maybe, you know, which, which is maybe seemingly related to the way that Jin saw her in those last moments. I don't know. Is there anything there? Or am I totally off my rocker? It's definitely a very close reading of the script. I don't think you're wrong. I think it, there definitely could have been an intention behind that, but they just move on from it so quickly that I don't, know that we're really meant to ascribe much meaning to it. I didn't. But that's um, what the show does. It moves on from Ji Hyun very quickly. Like we had a whole episode named after her and said, oh, well, they had a daughter. They have a daughter. She's still there. Yeah. You know, one one more thing about Jack before uh, before we move on to other stuff. 
I really love the scene with him and Sawyer, where Sawyer admits to Jack, you know, basically through his, you know, through his emotion here at what's gone down, that Jack was right about the bomb and that, you know, Mm -hmm. his own choice is what got Sun and Jin and Saeed killed. And then it just, it's beautiful there for me to see Sawyer admitting his fault and realizing the grief he's going through. I mean, this is, this is a new Sawyer for sure. But then I think the grace of that is matched and even exceeded then by Jack, who, you know, rather than lord it over Sawyer, like, yeah, I was right, you were wrong, you got them killed. Jack, Jack says, no, this wasn't your fault. This was Locke's fault. And, and not only Jack, you know, on the point of Sawyer saying, I should have listened to you, Jack says, I've been wrong before. Which you I know. think harkens back to the end of season five, which Sawyer blames 100%, him for. 100%. Yeah. 100%. It's, it's, it's just a beautiful moment full of grace for both of these characters where they're, you know, grieving together, but also like letting each other off the hook mm-hmm. and trying to, you know, each one ensure the other, like, no, 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 this isn't on you. Like, we're in this together. We can't blame each other for this stuff. It's great. A lot of growth there, yeah. All right. Well, I think that brings us back to where it all began, to you visiting Jack Bender and hearing all about his time on Lost. Um, this time, of course, we're going to focus on season six. Um yeah, this, tell me about going over to Jack's house. I won't be on this interview because I, I don't live in Los Angeles, but Sammy does. So set the scene for us here. It's so funny. I pulled up, I pulled up to his place and it's like, oh yeah, I remember this from six and a half years ago. Like it looks just about the same. Um, we sat down in his, in his studio, uh, which is outside the house. And he, um, you know, he had a, a book of his paintings that was published a few years ago that we, we talked about last time, the elephant in the room. Um, he's got another one coming out later, uh, later in 2023, he told me. So that's, uh, that's something to look out for. And we were surrounded by, um, by all sorts of, uh, you know, paintings and his dogs were going in and out. We kept, you'll hear, we keep kind of opening and closing the door to let his dogs in and out. Um, he, he mentions his wife, uh, Laura, a few times. That's Rabbi Laura Owens, who I forget if we mentioned this at the top of the show, at the, in the pilot, but, um, she was one of my uh, confirmation school teachers. And one other crazy thing, right behind him um, in the studio was the original mural that he did for the hatch. Mm. Um, he said that he had recently gotten it back from, because uh, you know, he painted that thing down there, and he, he said that he had recently gotten it back from ABC, that they had it in a conference room somewhere. So that wasn't there the last time I, I visited him, but he's, he's now got it, and it just sat behind us the whole interview. I'm not going to waste any time. Let's play it. I am here with Jack Bender. You'll remember him from the very first episodes of this podcast. He was an executive producer and the lead director on Lost. We're sitting here in his art studio in his home. Uh, Jack, thanks very much for uh, for doing this again. My pleasure, Sam. Before we started recording, you were you were kind of joking and saying even even last time we talked, which was amazingly six years ago at this point. How many? You, six, six years ago. Yeah. And that was six years after Lost ended, that even then you had trouble remembering stuff, and now we're now we're six years after that. Yeah. You've done so much stuff since Lost. Does Lost still feel like... Is it something that, that people ask you about, that you think about, that feels like it's still you know very much a part of your life, or is it, is it more like this is something from a long time ago that I did once? Well, I... I don't want to sound too 60s, but I do live in the moment in terms of work. But I will say the Lost was a very definitive turning point for me in my work. And it certainly was a really um, global landmark for television and storytelling. And I am fortunate and grateful every day that I caught that wave. Yeah. No pun intended. So I would say the answer to your question is it's a little bit of both. For me, I never watch anything that I did. And I know a lot of people over pan- the pandemic who were contacting me. They just watched Lost again, the whole thing, and how much they loved it, even the finale. And uh, But for me, I don't watch it. And someday, maybe I will. And maybe, and I've never even watched the DVDs, the making of the behind the scenes that probably would be really fun. They're, they're pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> well, let me let me take you back in time yeah. then. You know, so you'd, you'd finished the fifth year. Uh, it ends with the, the dramatic moment of Juliet blowing up the bomb and the screen turns white instead of black. I'm guessing you probably remember. I'm just curious what, what you remember about going into that, what you wanted to do with that sixth year and what it was like trying to figure that out. Well, the way we worked on Lost, I ran the show 
in Hawaii, Damon and Carlton ran it in LA, and as Carlton frequently pointed out to me, you know, they were the showrunners, and I was the guy, you know, who was directing and making sure the show looked great and all that. You were executing on their vision. Yeah, yeah. Well, I always felt like I, they wrote the recipes and maybe cooked a good portion of the meal. I finished cooking it with our team and then plated it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or sent it back and it was plated. Whatever, whatever that analogy might be. It was a, it was a wonderful collaboration. And Damon and Carlton were conceiving of what that last season would be. And I, in fact, did I ever tell you the story of walking with Damon in London when he was telling me the story? You did. And did I show you the picture? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I think, uh, go go and show me again, I don't remember. Ow, my back. Okay, here, I'll just bring it over. Um, So, in any case, they were conceiving of what the final season would be, and... Um, oh, you've got, you've got it framed here. Huh? Oh, you've got it framed. You never yeah. did show me this. Yeah. Well, that's Damon and I walking at Abbey Road. And I told you the story would walk about, right? Right. Yeah. And that's Damon posed under it. And then, in my picture, a guy goes by in a wheelchair. Right. Which was the extraordinary... And, and this was one. when he was telling you the this story This is when we were, we were at uh, the Tate Modern, and he and I walked back to our hotel, and he said... Uh, and we were going to have lunch, and he said, well, let me tell you on our walk. And he basically told me what the last season was going to be. Do you remember what your reaction was? My reaction was, um, I loved it. Uh, I loved the fact that we were going to end in the human sphere and not some big, explosive red phone at the CIA, they found the island, and something that a lot of our viewers and huge fans would have were longing for. Some great key to some mystery, and you cut back, 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 and it's on it, whatever it is. I think people were looking for that, and what I was most proud of was the fact that it was, the show was, they were always alive, even though I started and ended with um, Jack laying there with the dog, so people felt, oh, maybe it was a moment. The whole show was one minute, and he died. And but the show was always about how we live and how we die, and how we share our who we share our lives with, and which was what I believe the finale was about. And I found that very moving and was very proud of it. But I will also tell you, I v- vacillate between audacity and insecurity depending on the moment in the day where I go yes I know what I'm doing I mean I know what I want to do here as a director as a visualist as a storyteller with all the people around me who conceive and collaborate with me Um, and yet at the same time I can fluctuate and go what the hell do I know so what I'm saying is I was feeling that way about the sixth season of Lost in preparation for it, I felt, you know, when I knew that J.J. wanted me to do the finale and he wasn't going to come back for an, a grand gesture and do the finale like he did the brilliant pilot. Um, I didn't even know that was under consideration. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't, but they asked. He yeah. got asked a lot. Okay. And they said, no, it's Jack's show. He's going to do it. Um, but, and, and there could have been somebody else other than J.J. might have said, no, I'm doing it. You know, but JJ's a very gracious, generous guy and appreciates when people with him do really good work. As um, So I was certainly ca- uh, somewhat insecure about it. And I remember one day of shooting the, the finale. And I was walking around the set, and I think it was outside. And it, oh, you know when it was? It was right prior to shooting the church scene. Okay. When, and it was a scene with Jack and his father behind in, you know, the chaplain's office, whatever yep. it was. Yep. With the different religions, stained glass, which I wanted all the religions to be represented in the stained glass. I remember going, wow, you're doing the finale. This is a big deal. 
And I really felt the gravitas of that. And then we did that wonderful improvisational scene in the church where I basically, because a lot of the actors hadn't seen each other. I, if I'm repeating myself from six years ago, but I remember wanting to shoot it very documentary style, which is the way I did Exodus when they were leaving on the raft, everyone hugging and saying goodbye. I just said, say goodbye to who you want to and we'll follow you around with the cameras, which is what we did. And I love that ragged, real feel. Um, along with the scope of Lost, which was very cinematic. But I do think that, but I know that prior to everybody, there were little moments that Damon and Carlton wrote about Hurley lifting Sawyer up or whatever it was, Hurley lifting Jack yeah, up. Yeah, that, that's what just yeah. came to my mind actually yeah. at that moment. And, and there were little moments I knew I wanted that were on the page. And otherwise, I just said, hang out, talk to who you want to talk to. You haven't seen each other. And we just followed them around that church as they hugged each other and laughed and whatever. And it had a real celebratory, spontaneous, joyful vibe, which I loved and found very touching. Did you tell them where to sit when they were all sitting in the pews at the end? Or did they decide? Yeah. That? Yeah. One or two when I knew there was a moment where someone takes someone's hand yeah. that I wanted. Otherwise, I said, sit where you want to sit. The, the, the whole storyline that led up to that church scene, which, I mean, you said it. It's the, the last season is about how we live, how we die, the people that we live with. Yeah. And are, I assume when you had that conversation with Damon, when he told you what the last season was going to be about, that you, you knew you were filming the afterlife. I mean, that wasn't a surprise to you at the end. Yes. Yeah. Because that, yes. that's not revealed to the audience until the very last minutes there, that this is the afterlife. What, what was it like after five years of doing flashbacks and flash forwards to transition to this totally new kind of st style of storytelling where, where you couldn't tell people what it was and where you were dealing with these different versions of the mm -hmm. characters. It was just so... I mean, it was so different than what came before, so I'm curious what that was like to make. Well, every season, there were... Damon, and, Damon was pulling rabbits out of his hat. But since we were dealing with things like a flash-forward and a flash-back at the end of various seasons, like... And, and surprising the shit out of us and the audience, the, the, the one thing I knew I wanted was not to make the afterlife look like the afterlife. Hmm. I'm, you know, I love doing dreams. Uh, that happens a lot. You know, weird things on our show from that we're now doing. But I never, you know, dreams, dreams don't look like dreams. And I'm not a big fan of fancy Dutch angles in horror, you know, where the camera's like that and people are running down the hall for no... I just really like... In dreams, I always feel, and I, I wanted the afterlife to look like life. Hmm. So the staging in dreams can be very jump cutty and weird. Sometimes they're not. But um, I, I, in dealing with the afterlife, I basically dealt with it and people seeing each other again in a very... It's what we all wish for. So I wanted the show to be hopeful, but not hokey hmm. or sentimental. So I guess that's what I thought about. It makes me think of all of the moments in there where when, you know, characters would bump into each other in seemingly, you know, impossibly, you know, coincidental ways. It would sort of have this... Throughout the show of, or that scene? I, specifically in yeah. the afterlife yeah. scenes and the flash sideways, it felt like, is this really happening? It felt mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, this, this almost doesn't seem like it could be real, which I think is the effect that you're describing there. Real, not real. I mean, I kind of believe in everything. I believe... I do. I believe in ghosts. I believe in... I just believe in everything, and, and um, for better or worse. Well, one thing I'm, I'm also curious about, about the afterlife sequences, is that you had... I mean, you had all of those actors playing, you know, sort of different versions of themselves. I mean, you had uh, Michael Emerson doing, like, the meek school teacher instead of his, you know, conniving, manipulative self, and you had... Um, in the scene outside with Hurley, you mean, or just no? I just mean throughout, throughout that season. Oh, throughout that throughout season. Throughout that season, you had those characters playing, you know, these kind of not quite the same. I mean, Sawyer, Josh Holloway yeah. was playing a cop instead of a criminal. <clears throat> right. Um, Terry O'Quinn was in the wheelchair again. I, I guess I'm just curious if anything stands out in your mind of these actors having to suddenly like 
play different versions of themselves and, and I don't remember them. I actually don't remember yeah. discussing that with the actors. Our actors were so rich and so connected to what they had created and what Damon and Carlton wrote for them um, and what I directed them to do. They were very open. You know, Matt Fox, God love him, and we remain friends and respect each other to this day. Matt and I were frequently banging heads against each other. And at the end of the day, we found the compromise or whatever it was that worked for both of us. I was going to ask about Matt that that last season, he finally got the Emmy nomination for it. Um, And it was a very different season for him. I mean, he'd spent the first five years of that show being, you know, hard-headed and hard-charging and making all the decisions for everybody. And that that last year, he kind of, his character story, he has to stop and sort of contemplate and Mm -hmm. think really, and he ends up becoming the man of faith like Locke was. I I guess, do you remember anything in particular about working with him that last year, what he was bringing to that role that might have been different? Well, you know what's interesting, you say that because I won't go into the specifics of why and who was involved in the middle of it all, but... I I think Matt doesn't like authority when they... I think he respects directors when they're good, and he came to realize I was good at my job. But from the beginning, he just... He, he didn't like looping from the beginning because he felt like the performance was already made. That, that's the re-recording of dialogue. Re-recording later, right? of yeah. dialogue. I mean, if suddenly there's a jet that flies over and it's not meant to be, or whatever it is, the technical stuff at times irritated him. And he and I would, I'd say sometimes, okay, we don't need to do that, or we do. And he would bite the bullet and do it. But um, I don't think... but. But things changed the last season and a half, I would say, maybe even the last two seasons. And he and I got closer. And less, you know, I would go to him after a take and I'd go, just give me a little more salt or a little more pepper or a little more paprika or whatever. And he'd go, I did that. And I'd go, I know you did that. I saw it. I said, but just a little more. And he went, nah, I did it. I went, okay. So then we did a take, and he would do, which he would argue if he was on this uh, podcast with me right now, he would argue, because what he would always do is I'd cut and print it, and I'd say, thanks, you did it. And he said, no, I didn't. I didn't change anything. <laughs> and he would just like, rah, rah, rah. And, and it was always very amusing. But the last two seasons, or I'll say the last season specifically, all that, it's like taking a table and sanding the edges and having it not as sharp, just rounding the table. He and I rounded the table and it was a much closer, harmonious encounter, which might have been partially what his character was going through. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I that guess, is interesting. I guess the Emmy voters recognized it. It must yeah. have worked. A C- couple other actors I want to ask about with the last year. I mean, Terry O'Quinn, yeah. in that last year... On the island, he's playing a different... I mean, he's playing the villain. He's playing the man in black, the the big bad of the show. He's evil. He's conniving. If you say so. You know, do you remember any of this? Is this yeah, vaguely. I, I was just... I, the man in black, the man in white. I remember all that. Well, I, I just I just kind of wondered what it was like, you know, having Terry O'Quinn just suddenly be doing, you know, from the, the sort of hero of the show, and then suddenly he's playing the evil, conniving villain on the island. I think every actor loves that. Yeah. And I think that... I never had, and I don't believe Damon and Carlton ever got a phone call from any of our actors saying, why am I suddenly this guy? Yeah. Why am I suddenly that guy? I think that after five years of playing a character, if the writing is good and connected and rich, like it was on Lost, you're going to be playing a different aspect. You know, you're not going to suddenly go from, no pun intended, from black to white. Mm. There are those colors in everybody. Yeah. And I think that any actor who ends up get, getting to be more villainous or more whatever would pretty much dig it. Mm. And, and Terry did. I never once had a conversation, and he and I were close. I never had any conversations with him. We said, what the fuck am I doing this year? Never. What, what, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole kind of like 
good and evil story of that last year with Jacob. We've had Mark Pellegrino on too with Jacob and Titus Welliver doing the Man in Black. And what, what what do you remember about about those guys in that story? Well, I love them as actors. Yeah, I don't think that was our finest hour. You don't four hours. No, I felt that I really felt that the Man in Black and that history was not as interesting as the rest of the show. Um, you know, the way back when of it all. And I didn't, I wasn't on that train as much as other people were. And I'm glad it worked. Yeah. I have to be honest with you, I'm, I'm the same. I, yeah. I love the finale. I know there's yeah. people who didn't. I, yes. I think the finale is wonderful, but yeah. that would be the one part that I would point to as th this is where they probably could have done better. It's okay. I think there were a few things. I think there was the smoke monster visually. Mm -hmm. We could have done better. It looked like a hand puppet, you know, sometimes. And I thought there were some... Oh, and I directed the... Epi... Yeah, the Ottawali's brother episode, which I directed. Mr. Mr. Echo's Echo's brother, yeah. That I think the script wasn't our finest hour and my work wasn't my finest mm -hmm. hour, um, even though it ended up being fine. So, you know, you're doing 26 episodes a season. It's impossible, even doing 10 episodes of From now, or whatever I've done since Lost, where it's been limited. You know, the middle, I mean, it's just, it's just not possible there. Yeah. yeah. Even though I thought that the actors did sterling well, yeah. job. Yeah, a couple other storylines from the yeah. last year, and then I'll ask you some more specifics about the finale. That the main arc at the beginning of that year is the one that takes place at the temple. Um, mm -hmm. what, what do you remember about the temple and Hiroyuki Sonata? And, and the those, big statue and that the we big... didn't reveal, the big foot. Yes, yeah, tell me what you remember about that. I remember shooting there. Yeah. Um, it was a really wonderful set where we just had the bottom floor. <clears throat> I remember shooting the whole sequence inside the temple. Who was that? That was Locke? Oh, no, you're, you're talking about the foot. The foot, oh, in the talk, foot. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm... You're talking oh, we're, we're about talking the temple. About, oh, the temple that was across the, the water. In the jungle, yeah. With the wonderful Asian actor. Hiroyuki Sonata. Yeah, 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 it was wonderful. He was awesome. But that, that was a long storyline. That was a, a long storyline, and I remember it. I remember it being challenging uh, directorially at times, just all the logistics of working around. But, you know, one of the great things about Lost is whether you're doing a scene that's a little bit of CGI or all built, whether we're in, supposed to be in Iran or we're supposed to be in Australia or, you know, and everything was shot on the island, which is remarkable. I know. And I told you the one thing we got busted for was when Penny's father, that was the only time we left the island. Right, because he was on the play in on, uh, West End. He was in the play, right, right, <laughs> right. And we had to go shoot him in London. Yeah. Inside an apartment and inside an office building. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to London. We were all happy to go to London for a week. We did it. And I said, you know what? We're here. We've got to shoot one exterior scene. So sadly, I picked the place under the bridge, right, along the Thames. Was that the one with Yunjin and Allendale? I think so. Yeah. Whatever it was, which was a postcard shop, which I should have never picked anything that iconic. <laughs> but we did it because it worked out with our day and where we were shooting and blah, blah, blah. And to add insult to injury, the sun came out on the background. And it was shaded where we where the actors were. So when the image, when we shot it all, it looked completely like CGI. <laughs> and we got busted for it. And they said, and the fans said, you, you know, that was the cheesiest one shot, CGI fake shot of all the places you've been. That's and funny. I went, that's the only time we went anywhere. That's funny. Uh, let me, let me ask you about, uh, I promise this will be the last, you know, like maybe sore point I'll, I'll bring up. Sore away. S Saeed and Naveen Andrews yeah. in that last season. Saeed is, is one of my favorite characters on Lost. Mm -hmm. um, my co-host Rosie feels the same. Yeah. Actually, we, we had Leonard Dick on earlier in the podcast, and he referred. He said that in the writer's room, he was known as the vice president of Saeed Incorporated because he loved Saeed so much. <laughs> I, was, I was frustrated by what happened with him in the last year. I don't know if you remember much. He, he sort of dies and comes back to life. And oh, and his wife. And Isn't there some stuff with his wife? Or that's another episode where she gets hit by a car. Oh, that, well, she also, yeah, earlier yeah. in the show, she gets hit by a yeah, car. Yeah, she is he, a nice actress. We, we interviewed her. She's lovely. Yeah, yeah love. Andrea Gabriel. Yeah, yeah. But he, I don't know, and he, he just, he spends the whole season kind of being, 
inhabited by an evil spirit of some kind. And I, he, I, did you remember any of that? Okay. I uh, my memory of working with uh, Naveen. Yeah, Naveen was that we were we really enjoyed working together. He's a great actor. I'm I'm hopeful to work with Naveen in the near future because he is really really exceptional although one of the first scenes you want to hear a little story yeah one of the first scenes we did together season one he comes running off the beach into where the uh woods started right there on the north shore it was like you could take someone out so i started a dolly track with him running in and i think he's going to dig something up i can't remember what it was but it had an urgency so we rehearsed it and he comes running in, blah, 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 drops to his knees, and as he starts digging, he starts saying something like, I know it's here, or whatever, I can't remember what his dialogue was out there. And so we rehearse it, and I said, Naveen, try starting the line before you're on your knees. And he went, what? So, and he yells at me, that's the fucking worst idea. I was screaming and I'm going, whoa, what are you talking about? He said, why would I say something before I went down and blah, 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 blah. And he's screaming the cruise looking at me. And this is season one and early on and I went, well, I got an idea. What? Why don't you just try it? We can do one your way, one my way. All right. So we do it his way. We do it my way. And he got up and went, yeah, that works. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, from whenever, we ended up being really fast friends. And um, and I, I admire him so much. And I hope we get to work together. As I do with Terry O'Quinn and all these people. My God, they're all great. You filmed the episode with the, the submarine, uh, right? Where yes. The, at the end with the big oh, explosion. Oh, the big explosion, with yes. The bomb. Yeah, yeah. Talk about filming that. Because I rewatched that recently with the, the sequence where so Saeed sacrifices himself and then... This, the bomb goes off, it floods, Jin and Sun die. Oh, that's right. It, it's the most probably dramatic and heart-wrenching ten minutes of that entire show. So really? I'm curious what you remember filming filming about it. And he opens up the water thing. Yeah. 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 Um, I remember the challenges yeah. of building the sets so we could shoot it in such a way and tell that story and flood it. Um, we did it a combination at... The studio where we shot, um, the Hawaiian studios, um, the, we had a pool inside, a tank, right. which we were able to use at various times and not make it look like a pool, obviously. And part of that flooding sequence we built in the pool so that we could hold the water back and then when the door opened... Um, and yank the actors back. It was a, it was an action sequence that was very challenging. And in a situation like that, you just have to make sure you're getting the characters and the acting. I mean, for me, the action is sort of the landscape of the scene and what the characters are going through, whether it's Elizabeth Mitchell letting go and falling into the hole and I actually have a story about that. But I, I remember being focused on the action, the visuals, making sure we were making it believable, and at the same time that the acting was what it wanted to be. Um, and when we were doing the scene with Elizabeth Mitchell and Sawyer holding on to her... Yeah, at the end of the fifth season. You know, I shot Sawyer stuff. I shot Elizabeth stuff and whatever else I needed, and it went beautifully. They really delivered. It was very emotional. And I get a call, that was on a Friday, I get a call on a Saturday by our DP. That's your director of photography? Correct. Okay. John Bartley, who was on the show for five years and did a beautiful job. We were one of the last shows shooting film, which was, and my goal was to juxtapose close character shots along with Big Vista to give it a real cinematic scope, which it had and people responded to. In any case, we were, we shoot that scene, as I said, it went really well, and I get the call from John Bartley, and John says, we have a problem, and I say, what? 
He says, the shots on Sawyer are too dark. Ooh. And I went, what? Never happened. Ever. You know, occasionally, yeah, it's a night shot. We can bring it up a little. You know, the stuff that happens when you're making film. Or video now. So I went, how'd that happen? He said the camera assistant had the aperture to, the numbers weren't right. And I went, and our camera assistants were great. It was just a serious fuck up. And what do we have to, I said, is it salvageable? And he went, no, we can't use it. We have to reshoot it. And I know how much Josh thought about that scene, cared about that scene, and gave us when we were shooting. So I call him on the Saturday. I said, I got bad news. His phone call starts, Jack, hey, what's happening, man? I said, well, I got bad news. What? I said, everybody's fine in our world. But there was a big screw up with the camera department. And I tell him. And he goes, what? He goes, berserk. God love Josh. Oh, I fucking can't do that again. Are you serious? That's just not possible. That's not right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It had never happened. Uh, I went, I'm going to get off the phone now because I know you're crazed. And all I can say to you is I'm going to be there with you and you'll do it again and you'll do it great. But I know you're furious and I would be too. And I am too. So, cut to me telling Elizabeth Mitchell, and this is Elizabeth's response, said, oh, that's a drag. Okay, well, just an opportunity to do it better. <laughs> Which is, of course, that's a very positive response. And she's kind of like that. She takes it seriously, too, but she said, shit happens and we'll do it better. And they did. And we got ready to do it. And Josh had calmed down two days later. And we did it and they did it great. But that was the one and only time there was that kind of mess. And uh, poor Josh had to eat it. But like I said, the scene was great. I, I never would have guessed, because you could make yeah. an argument that's the best scene on the show. I mean, well, it's incredible. have you interviewed Josh? Unfortunately not. No, Unfortunately okay. not. Well, I will pass that on to him. I... Yes, I will. Thank you. Um... Well, no, okay, no, no, no. But let me so let me go yeah. back. So the, the 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 way we got here was talking about the submarine. So you had yeah. you had Young Jin and and Daniel Day Kim. You know, I mean, they. I thought they really brought it in that moment. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, everybody did, and we had a real submarine that was a um, part of an exhibit at Pearl Harbor, which we used for some of the shots. Then we built part of a set, and then, you know, the way you make movies. And everybody was great. Yeah. Everybody was great. Oh, I remember what I was going to ask. Yeah. I was just going to say, with, with Josh and Elizabeth, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how you felt about it, but for me, and I think for a lot of fans in the show, seeing seeing their storyline play out those last two years, and, right. and especially the moment they get together in the finale with the, the vending machine and the candy yeah, bar, yeah. That, that's one of the highlights. I mean, it's wonderful to watch them. Yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed it too. Oh, to yeah. Do that. yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know what else is wonderful? There's a moment that Evie has, Evangeline, um, where she gets out of the car. I think when she's going into the funeral, even though we don't know when she leaves she's... Jack in the car, and she just throws a look back and walks away. I know the look you're talking about. <clears throat> it's brilliant. Really good. That look just gives you chills. I'm getting chills thinking about it. Yeah, because she knows what's going on and she's so excited for, for yeah. Jack to be able to find out that, yeah. that he doesn't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I agree with you. There was, um, is, that the se is that the sequence that when Charlie, the flashbacks with Charlie coming and playing a rock show? and That's a little bit before that. That's a little bit before that. That, was, that must have been a fun night too because you had the whole, the whole concert going on and the charity gala. Everyone was there. I mean, I'll tell you something. Yeah. That wasn't so fun. No? Well, Dom, who I adore... Dominic Monaghan, yeah. And was very concerned when he was going to die, and whether we were cutting too close to the bone. And, of course, we didn't, and pulled it off, and it was extraordinary. Not Penny's boat. I was walking in Paris with Laura, 
and I was wearing, and two guys came walking, two French guys smoking, like in their 20s, and they're wearing t-shirts to say, not Penny's Boat. And I don't speak French. And Laura went, look. And we stopped and said, da, 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 Jack Bender. I did the show. Oh, my God. And we took pictures. So in any case, but Dom wanted to, he said to me at one point, he said to me, I'm going to bring drinking vodka on stage, but it's just water, just so you know. When he's doing the concert at the end. Of but it. I, want, I want to be really screwed up and bad boy rock and roll. And so I said, okay. And then there was this whole reason because of um, uh, Evangeline, not personally, but story-wise, and all this stuff was going on. And so he was, when I was shooting him, there were certain moments he had to achieve in the scene, where he had to look off and see something. I think he had to see Claire giving birth or going in. Oh, that's place. right. Yeah. And go, running away yeah. and all that stuff. And so, and he's up there being Johnny Rotten, you know, or John Lennon, who's his hero, being a bad boy in Germany, fucking singing the song and screwing around. And I kept saying, I said, Dom, look at Claire. And he went, what? Look at Claire. And he'd go and he'd drink booze and he'd play more. I said, look at Claire. He said, fuck you. Fuck everybody. He was literally playing bad boy rock and roll. So there was literally over the microphone, I'm going, Don, quit fucking around and do it. And he said, okay. And then he would say to the audience, okay, the man wants me, the man wants me to do this now, so I'm going to do this. <laughs> he was getting a little too into character. Wildly into character. And, <laughs> and afterwards, I said, seriously? And he went, hey, man, I told you. I said, well, I didn't realize you were going that far. And I said, and, and, but, you know, we love each other and hugged, and it ended up cutting great. And I cut out a lot of that stuff. But um, that was an interesting night. Yeah. And we had a lot to shoot, so it's, you know, whatever. It's one of those nights that has uh, some bumps along the road. But, you know... All was uh, immediately forgiven, and he was great in the show. He's he's wonderful. We remain friends to this day. You know who else was there? We've had uh, Ian Cusick on the podcast a couple of times, and he, he had an interesting role that last year too. Uh, kind yes, of he did. Popping, popping in and out and being all knowing. That must have been. That must have yeah, been and I I thought he was brilliant. I remember shooting the very first scene with him in the stadium, where he's jogging. Yeah, and uh, sits next to Jack and says some things. He says uh, you got to lift it up. That's right. You got to lift it up. And I remember shooting those scenes and just thinking he was great. Is and that why you brought him back? Because yeah. Of, yeah. Well, you know, Emerson wasn't supposed to come back. I know. You know, and when Damon and Carlton saw the dailies, it was the moment where he said, um, you got milk? Eating the cake or the cookie or whatever that was. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> got any milk? They went... This guy's genius. We got to have him back. And then he ended up becoming the leader. He was like signed for a four arc, uh, thing. That was it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's actually, I want to say one thing about episodic TV when you're working with wonderful showrunner writers. And that is that like a novel, you can find yourself. And that's also 24 episodes or 26, but you, you can, I always felt that whatever they told me at the beginning of the season, they would like, if you're looking at the top of a mountain or the bottom, depending on your point of view, but if you're at the top of the mountain and you know you're going to do a ski run, I can't ski at all, I hate it, Laura's good, and and you see the poles along the way, and you know story point are the poles. We're going here, we're doing this, we're doing that, and maybe they're ten poles, maybe they're whatever. But you can also go off into the trees, right? And suddenly go on this other road. And Emerson was one of those other roads. Absolutely. And, and when those happen, I think that's sometimes the best stuff. You know, I think that's sometimes the best stuff. And when you're working with wonderful riders, they'll go there. Yeah, and Emerson was one of those roads yeah. that well, no looking back. So there are two really beautiful things that Jack said here that I want to call out. There's also one really funny one, which I'm going to start with, is 
the, that the smoke monster looked like a hand puppet. Um, <laughs> it to, watching the episode this week, I really was thinking about because there's that shot where the smoke monster, um, comes in and like removes Richard from the conversation. And it really does look like a sock puppet on the end of a hand. Just like <laughs> if you're like a baby and that's your point of view and it's like coming at your face. <laughs> that's funny. That really made me laugh. Good um, call. Good call. That was a, a legit scary moment on the show, by the way. But yeah, point about the smoke monster holes. Um, yeah. So two things that, that Jack said that we've touched on, but that I think are really insightful. One, the show was always about how we live and how we die and who we share our lives with. We agree. Um, you know, Lost was not about the mysteries. It was about the characters. Um, and the other that I think really reflects well on season six is this idea that dreams, you know, when you have a dream, when you are asleep having a dream, they don't necessarily have the quality of a dream. Like it looks like real life. And I like the idea that they applied that to the flash sideways. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that you were in this new place. Like it, it looks like real life, except for, you know, there are moments where I feel like, oh, the sun is like a little too bright. This doesn't quite feel real, but the vast majority of the time, it just looks like life. And that's why it takes so long to sort of realize what's going on. I that agree. Was really interesting. I mean, I remember the first time I watched it, even till the last minute, I didn't get what was going on. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know that anybody did until Christian says it. Yeah. But then it all makes sense. You watch it back and it feels right. But yeah, you know, I, yeah, it was it was a good strategy that he pursued. Yeah. What stood out to you in this? I mean, I appreciated him acknowledging that Across the Sea was not their best work. Um, you know, you can say it. Um, but no, just like I don't know, some of the stories about working with with the actors, like how you know the whole the whole thing about how finally in that last season he and Matthew Fox finally kind of found a good working rhythm and how that might help explain, you know, how his acting got more highly regarded at the end of the show. I thought that was really interesting. No, there's, there's, you know, he's got a bunch more stories in the second half of the interview next week and in the finale or next week, you know, a couple weeks when we finish here. So I I hope everyone sticks around and and listens to that. Yeah, I certainly hope you guys stick around for the finale. My goodness. Um, Yeah. Uh, Gosh, this is really going to be it. This is the end. Plus, maybe an episode about the new man in charge. That's TBD, true. stick around. That's stick true. Around. I don't think either of us think this will be the final episode of The Hatch that we ever do. But we would still sincerely love it if you have never left us a hot take before. If you have left us ten hot takes before, we would love to include your thoughts about the finale, about Lost in general. So give us a call, 9546-DHARMA. If you are outside the U.S., just add the country code 1. Uh, you can also record a voice memo on your phone and message it to our Facebook page. Which is at facebook.com slash the hatch podcast. I, I will admit I prefer you don't do that because it's a pain in the butt to download voice messages from Facebook, which I, I no matter how many times I do it, I always forget how. And it, that's fine. You can call us and leave us your hot take however you want. We are also on Twitter at the hatch podcast. Uh, so follow us there and uh, come say hello. Our cover art is by Danny Roth, my younger brother. And our theme music is by Andy G. Cohen. We still love it if you would rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are listening. Yeah, um, keeps the show alive. We want people to continue listening to this for, uh, you know, months and years to come, even when we're, we're done doing it, which will, which will be very soon. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Namaste. Namaste.